Picture yourself strapped into a small spacecraft, 36 stories high, sitting atop the most powerful machine ever built. Keep in mind that the machine you are on has never flown a human being before and has had only two tests, the most recent of which failing catastrophically. Your mission is to go a quarter of a million miles away to a place no human has ever gone. In terms of your survival, you've been informed that you have a 50-50 chance of ever returning to Earth and to make sure to record a final goodbye to your loved ones. This was what the astronauts of the Apollo 8 mission would encounter in December of 1968, and on our latest installment of Hindsight History, we tell their story. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. On the morning of Saturday, October 5th, 1957, the world awoke to headlines announcing that the Soviet Union had launched the world's first satellite. The silver ball, a little more than twice the size of a basketball, was called Sputnik. Never before had human beings managed to hurl an object out of Earth's atmosphere with such speed that it became part of the cosmic realm. At first, America marveled at the accomplishment, and the best part was, they could witness it for themselves. Anyone with a pair of binoculars could see its carrier rocket streaming overhead. As the days continued, America's amazement gave way to darker realities. The United States was the most technologically advanced nation in the world, and only 12 years earlier had helped end the Second World War in dramatic fashion. It should have been the first to put a satellite into orbit. Nuclear physicist Edward Teller, considered to be the father of the hydrogen bomb, stated that the United States had lost a battle more important than Pearl Harbor. The United States and Soviet Union had been allies during World War II, but their collaboration began to collapse after the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan in 1945. The bomb was America's effort to end the war in the Pacific theater. But to Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, it was a sign of America's intention to dominate the world. Just 14 days following the bombing on Hiroshima, Stalin issued a secret decree ordering the urgent development of Russia's own nuclear weapon. American diplomats soon paid attention to the dictator when he proclaimed that the Soviet Union would overtake the West in science and technology. It was soon understood that this would be a new kind of conflict, one that was not fought with soldiers on the battlefield, but with threats. A Cold War. Perhaps most important, it would be a race to see which side could harness technology to achieve things that, until now, seemed unimaginable. Less than a month after Sputnik, the Soviets launched another satellite, only this time it carried a passenger. A dog known to the world as Laika. Despite Laika winning the hearts of viewers the world over, she was no publicity stunt. She was the first step towards sending a man into space. It was apparent that the Soviets hadn't designed the satellite to return safely to Earth. After approximately seven hours into the flight, no further signs of life were received from the spacecraft. It was later confirmed that Laika died from overheating. The spacecraft, named Sputnik 2, disintegrated during re-entry. Following further behind in the space race, the United States pushed to launch its own rocket. 
Two months after Sputnik, a Vanguard rocket counted down on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Unlike the Soviets who conducted space operations in secret, the United States broadcast the launch to the entire country on live television. Upon ignition, the Vanguard began to rise, but not soon after, began to hesitate and sink back into the launch pad in a tremendous explosion. Within minutes, the media began calling the project Flopnik. However, the United States persisted. In January of 1958, the 30-pound satellite Explorer would successfully launch and orbit around Earth. This became a warning that demonstrated how quickly things could change when a country believed its survival was at stake. And in November of 1960, America elected John F. Kennedy as president. According to the new president, America could not afford to be second to the Russians in anything. This would soon come to the forefront when less than three months after Kennedy's inauguration, tracking stations controlled by American intelligence detected the flight of a Soviet spaceship and something peculiar inside. Within minutes, the Soviet government announced that they'd put the first man into space, 27-year-old cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, and he'd already made a complete orbit around Earth. Yet few in the general public knew the extent to which the Soviets had rushed the mission and the critical tests they'd skipped. Upon re-entering the atmosphere, Gagarin's spaceship began spinning uncontrollably and plummeted toward Earth. He managed to eject and parachute down unharmed, but almost 200 miles off course. At the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union laid in ruins. Now, 16 years later, it had put the first man into orbit around Earth. Yuri Gagarin was given a grand parade in Red Square, where people cried in the streets and hung pictures of the cosmonaut in their homes. The mission dealt an even bigger blow to the United States. We are behind, Kennedy admitted at a press conference. Kennedy needed to strike back. He requested for his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, to find a long-term challenge that NASA would undertake to allow sufficient time for the space agency to catch up to the Soviets. One that was so difficult, it would put America ahead in space for good. On May 25, 1961, Kennedy addressed a special joint session of Congress. He warned that a battle was being waged around the world, one in which achievement in space could prove decisive. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The room stood silent. The United States hadn't even put a man into orbit around Earth. Now the president was committing the country to landing astronauts on the moon and on an eight and a half year deadline. In mid-November of 1963, Kennedy visited Cape Canaveral where he was briefed on America's latest development, the Saturn V rocket, a 36-story, three-stage booster being built to take Americans to the moon. Standing outside with rocket designer Werner von Braun, Kennedy shook his head in wonder at it all. Six days later, the president was dead from an assassin's bullet. In the wake of Kennedy's killing, some wondered whether the nation's will to land a man on the moon might have died with him. Some NASA analysts put the chances of landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade at just one in 10. But NASA wouldn't give up. Over the next three years, the Americans continued to challenge the Soviets for supremacy in space. This all collapsed on January 27, 1967, when three astronauts strapped themselves in for a simulated countdown at Cape Kennedy in Florida. They would be doing the real mission, Apollo 1, 
in three weeks' time, spearheading NASA's new Apollo program into orbit around Earth. At 6.31 p.m., one of the astronauts screamed into his microphone a word that sounded like fire. Flames spread through the capsule. None of the three men could overcome the cabin's highly pressurized atmosphere and move the inward opening hatch. Technicians rushed to the scene, but were beaten back by the heat and fire. Almost six minutes passed before they could get inside. Rescue personnel found the now deceased crew with their spacesuits fused to the melted interior of the spacecraft. Within a matter of minutes, three American heroes had died without ever leaving the launch pad. Hundreds of NASA employees were reduced to tears by the tragedy. Many in the press blamed NASA for risking safety by rushing to meet the deadline of 1970 to reach the moon. After a congressional investigation into the fire, NASA was ready to resume flight operations. Apollo 2 and 3 had been canceled in a reorganization following the fire. And on November 9, 1967, controllers counted down the final seconds to the launch of Apollo 4. This would be the first test of the massive Saturn V booster, a rocket more powerful than any NASA had ever launched, and the only one capable of taking a man to the moon. For the mission, NASA did not put a man on board. The flight mission worked nearly flawlessly. It was clear now that America stood a fighting chance of meeting Kennedy's impossible deadline. NASA would continue another unmanned test of the lunar module in 1968 with Apollo 5 that also succeeded. And then came Apollo 6. Just the second test of the Saturn V rocket Liftoff proceeded normally, but just a few minutes into the flight, things started to go haywire. The rocket's first stage began to shake violently while pieces of the spacecraft flew off. A backup plan was put into effect, but failed. To many at NASA, the 10-hour flight mission had been a disaster. The very same day, United States intelligence agencies delivered a top-secret report to high-ranking policymakers and top NASA officials. It stated that the Soviets planned a manned circumlunar flight by the likely time frame of 1969 with the possibility of late 1968. NASA had no plans to send men to the moon in 1968. NASA always proceeded deliberately and carefully. They didn't skip ahead. The risks of manned spaceflight were simply too great. But their hand had been dealt. In August of 1968, astronaut Frank Borman, a 40-year-old no-nonsense former West Point cadet, was summoned to Deke Slayton's office in Houston. Slayton was in charge of managing astronaut training and choosing crews for manned space missions. If an astronaut flew on board a NASA spacecraft, it was because Slayton had chosen him to go. Borman was confused at the request. As the commander of the future Apollo 9 mission, he was preparing for an assignment to orbit the Earth, test the spacecraft, and return home. As Borman entered Slayton's office, he suspected something unusual was afoot when he was asked to close the door behind him. Slayton addressed him without even sitting down. We just got word from the CIA that the Russians are planning a lunar flyby before the end of the year. We want to change Apollo 8 from an Earth orbital to a lunar orbital flight. Frank, do you want to go to the moon? The idea startled Borman. Apollo 8 was meant to fly in just four months' time, certainly not to the moon. Now, they wanted Borman to change missions and fly to the moon, a distance of 240,000 miles in just 16 weeks. The mission Slayton was proposing would be exquisitely dangerous, but it also had the power 
to change history. Borman hadn't joined the ranks of NASA for the usual benefits. He had little interest in exploration and the perks of beautiful women and discounts on Corvettes. The public adoration also meant nothing to him. He joined NASA for a single purpose, to fight the Soviet Union on the world's new battlefield, outer space. Without even taking a few minutes to consider Slayton's question, Borman accepted the mission. He had no idea how the space agency would do its part to be ready by December. He could only trust that NASA had carefully crafted the mission and had taken their time to work out the science. Even if NASA could manage all that, the risks of undertaking a lunar mission in December were enormous. Upon returning from Houston, Frank Borman informed his two astronaut comrades, Jim Lovell and Frank Anders, the update on their new assignment. Jim Lovell had joined NASA along with Borman in 1962 as part of the New Nine, the second group of astronauts enlisted by the agency. Like Borman, he was 40 and a test pilot, but unlike his commander, had a deep passion for exploring the cosmos. Bill Anders was just 34. He'd come up through the ranks as a fighter pilot, not a test pilot. The team of three followed a militaristic chain of command. Borman, as the commander, had decided their fate. Now, NASA needed a flight plan. Ordinarily, that took months to devise. But time was suddenly a luxury. Early in the afternoon on August 18th, Borman met with NASA's top designers, planners, and engineers in Houston. The team had to hammer out a blueprint for Apollo 8's flight to the moon. Two key aspects of the flight also had to be addressed. The first was Lunar Orbit Insertion, or LOI which would come when the spacecraft arrived at the moon and fired its first engine in order to slow down enough to be captured by lunar gravity and go into orbit around the moon. This would occur around the far side of the moon, completely out of communication with the engineers on Earth who might catch any equipment malfunctions or mistakes by the crew. There was no backup to the engine. If it didn't fire, Apollo 8 would whip around the moon and return to Earth. The real problem would come if the engine fired incorrectly. Too short, and the spacecraft would fly off into eternal space. Too long, and it would crash into the moon in less than an hour. During their final two revolutions, the astronauts would get ready for the riskiest part of the mission, Trans-Earth Injection, or TEI which would come when the spacecraft fired the engine again, this time to gain enough speed to get the spacecraft out of lunar orbit and on its way back to Earth. As before, the firing would be done over the far side of the moon, out of contact with Houston and the rest of the world. It was a critical maneuver. If it misfired, the ship could crash into the moon. If it failed to fire, Apollo 8 would become a possession of the moon forever. During simulations at NASA, more than once the astronauts perished in the scenario because someone didn't fix problems correctly or in time. Over and over, scenarios were run, often for full days at a time. The more catastrophic, the better. Until repetition of dying helped the men learn to survive. If Apollo 8 survived re-entry, and if its heat shield succeeded in preventing its incineration in temperatures that would reach 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the triple canopy of parachutes would splash down in the Pacific Ocean, and the historic voyage would have ended after a little more than six days. When Frank Borman's wife Susan pulled NASA's flight director Chris Kraft aside and asked what the chances were of her husband surviving the mission, Kraft didn't sugarcoat things and gave the astronaut's wife an honest answer. How's 50-50, he said.
At 2.36 a.m. on Saturday, December 21st, 1968, Deke Slayton knocked on the bedroom doors of the astronauts and told them it was time. After breakfast, the crew of Apollo 8 made their way to the suiting room. The custom-tailored one-piece suits could be pressurized and were made fireproof by Teflon cloth. Fully dressed, the astronauts looked like a futuristic version of the Michelin Man. Gloves were affixed and secured. Finally, a transparent bubble helmet was attached to the neck ring. Borman's head was so large that his helmet cost an extra $45,000 to build. Now, fully suited up, with pure oxygen flowing into their suits from portable ventilators, the crew of Apollo 8 lumbered down a long hallway. From a distance of just a few yards, the Saturn V was mythically tall. Technicians closed and secured the hatch on the Apollo 8 spacecraft at 5.34 a.m. The three men awaited their final moments until countdown. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 1, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern By now, Apollo 8 was barely one-third as long as it had been at launch, and millions of pounds lighter. The third stage engine pushed the spacecraft even faster, to a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. Moments later, Apollo 8 was in orbit around Earth. In Houston, the rows of NASA team members exhaled. This was the first time the Saturn V had been asked to deliver men into space, and it had succeeded. Forty-five minutes into the flight, Apollo 8 approached darkness for the first time as it moved eastward. Outside the cabin windows, the crew could see lightning flashes from a storm down below, as if a thousand paparazzi had gathered to take pictures of them from the clouds. I can see most of South America, all the way up through Central America, the Yucatan, and the peninsula of Florida. There's a big swirling motion just off the East Coast. Yeah, tell the people in Tierra del Fuego to put on their raincoats, look like a storm is out there. The Saturn's third stage looked good for translunar injection, the maneuver that would propel the spacecraft out of its orbit around Earth and on to the moon. To pull it off, Apollo 8 needed to accelerate from its current speed to nearly 24,000 miles per hour. The exact moment of the engine's firing depended on complex mathematics designed to put the spacecraft at just the right point where it could slingshot around the far side of the moon and make a free return to Earth if necessary. For the first time, mankind was about to leave its home planet in search of a new world. Earth answered immediately, using its gravity to pull back on the ship and slow Apollo 8's speed as it traveled away from the planet. In mission control, Gene Kranz, who'd been a flight director for previous missions, got up from his seat, left the room, and broke down in tears at the magnitude of the moment. While the astronauts had been focused on navigating away from the discarded third stage, Apollo 8 had passed through the Van Allen belts, two massive donut-shaped bands of intense radiation that encircle Earth. 
The belts had long been thought to pose a danger, even a deadly one, to space travelers. For years, scientists and government agencies had tried to figure out a safe way through the belts. In the end, NASA determined that the Apollo spacecraft would be traveling so fast that the risk of harmful radiation exposure would be minimal. To test it, NASA had fitted each member of the Apollo crew with a personal radiation meter to measure the levels of radiation to which the astronauts had been exposed. Anders gave Houston the verdict. After passing through both belts, none of the astronauts had received more than about one-tenth the radiation of an average chest x-ray. Until now, the spacecraft had flown with one of its sides exposed to the sun and the other side facing away, but that arrangement couldn't last much longer without damaging the ship by broiling one side and freezing the other. To solve the problem, NASA had developed a procedure called passive thermal control in which the commander slowly rotated the ship on its long axis. Temperatures would become evenly distributed as the spacecraft turned. The maneuver had earned the nickname Barbecue Mode. In Houston, Mission Control began to prepare for when the spacecraft reached the moon, when Apollo 8 would attempt the complex maneuver known as lunar orbit insertion. Engineers, mathematicians, physicists, and scientists had spent years developing the calculations. Controllers in Houston believed they had calculated it correctly, but they wouldn't know for sure until the astronauts tried to light the engine behind the moon. Now, just over 3,000 miles from the moon, Mission Control gave the final decision. For months, Borman had been fixated on a particular moment in the flight plan, the instant when Apollo 8 would lose radio contact with Earth as it slipped behind the moon. NASA had calculated to the second when it expected its communications with Apollo 8 to go dead. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Houston, Apollo 8. The engine worked flawlessly. Radio contact had been lost at precisely the second NASA had calculated. Borman could hardly believe it. Another critical hurdle in the Apollo 8 mission had been cleared. In Houston, controllers looked at each other with a sense of wonder and relief, shaking their heads and then shaking hands. Apollo 8 now belonged to the moon. Knowing their engine had made good, the astronauts were free to take a look out of their windows. The size and number of craters was staggering. There were countless numbers of them, some as small as the eye could discern, others as wide as European countries. To Borman, the lunar far side seemed like a dreamscape, straight out of science fiction. The men could have watched the moon for hours, but there was work to do. Borman would fly the ship. Lovell would take navigation sightings, confirm lunar landmarks, and assess potential landing sites for future missions. Anders would pull heavy photography duty while monitoring the spacecraft. Apollo 8 had 10 revolutions to get all its work done, 20 hours total.
On the third day of the mission, Anders was immersed in his cameras when Apollo 8 came around for its third pass. As the spacecraft continued to roll, Anders saw something appear in his window just over the moon's western horizon. A shiny sphere of royal blues, swirling whites, and sun-baked browns rose over the rough, all-gray moon. The Earth was rising, and it looked brighter than ever. A moment later, the spacecraft rolled so far that Earth finally vanished from its windows. Earthrise was the most beautiful sight the astronauts had ever seen, the only color visible in all the cosmos. On Christmas Eve, 1968, at around 8.30 p.m. Houston time, the astronauts prepared for a worldwide broadcast. In 64 countries, a billion people, more than one quarter of the world's population, joined them, waiting to hear what the first men at the moon would say on Christmas Eve. They had long known that they would need words worthy of the moment. We are uh, now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. In his studio at CBS, Walter Cronkite fought back tears as he came back on the air. Well, quite a finish for this last transmission from the moon, Apollo 8. From their television cameras there, 230,000 miles from Earth. Across much of the globe, people streamed outside and looked up, trying to pick out the three men who'd just spoken to them knowing it was impossible, but trying all the same. As the men approached the end of their mission, NASA managers were haunted by the final hurdle ahead, Trans-Earth Injection, or TEI. For the maneuver, there were five pages of switch settings, equipment checks, and adjustments each of which had to be verified by a second crewman in the knowledge that one mistake could prove fatal. NASA had considered a plan for a lunar rescue mission should something catastrophic happen during TEI. It involved sending a single astronaut to the moon. Once in lunar orbit, rescue would involve complex maneuvers that would also place the rescuing astronaut at risk. Such a contingency would add significantly to the agency's already massive budget. In the end, the idea was scrapped. After the ship had emerged from the moon's eastern limb, Mission Control confirmed. We are now less than 30 seconds uh, to the scheduled time of ignition. Lovell pressed the ignition to the engine, and then there was only silence. A wave of excitement washed over the room. Re-entry into Earth's atmosphere would officially start at an altitude of 400,000 feet. There was almost no margin for error. If the spaceship came in too steep, it would cause massive gravitational forces that would crush the ship and crew, generating heat so intense that it would incinerate the men and turn Apollo 8 into a burning meteor. The crew could only hope that the heat shield would do its job. 
Outside his window, Anders saw a terrifying sight. Baseball-sized chunks of the heat shield flying off. He waited for the heat to sear through the spacecraft and melt the crew. But Apollo 8 did not melt. Twenty seconds later, the spacecraft had been slowed by the atmosphere. 100,000 feet below, the USS Yorktown found Apollo 8 on its radar. At around 30,000 feet, two parachutes shot out of the ship as they streaked up into the sky. At that moment, Apollo 8 came in flat and bashed into the Pacific Ocean at just about the most violent impact possible. All three men were hanging upside down in their straps. Garbage that had collected in the cabin streamed down on them. Anders could only smile at the picture. Three conquering heroes returned from the moon, hanging upside down and dripping in garbage. In the days that followed, it seemed the world talked only about Apollo 8. Telegrams for the astronauts poured in by the thousands. One, however, stood out from the rest. It came not from a world leader or celebrity, but from an anonymous stranger. It had traveled over segregated towns in the South, through jungles in Vietnam where young men fell, over the coffins of two of America's great civil rights leaders, and across streets flooded with protesters and police. It read, you saved 1968. 